Alrighty, welcome to Too Weird to Live, Too Rare to Die, a show telling the story of founders, stories, stories, a show telling the stories of founders, investors and operators working to turn the world we live in into a better place. I always butcher it every single time. So today we have Simon Griffith, uh, Griffiths, I've done that, I've butchered that as well, from Who Gives a Crap, <laughs> Simon, uh, welcome to the show, thanks for coming on. Yeah, thank you for having me. Cool. Um, hey, look, Simon, before we dive into the story of Who Gives a Crap, which is an amazing um, entrepreneurial story and super inspiring, and, and um, especially for us at Athena, um, keen to dive in. But before we jump into any of that, um, it's tradition here at Too uh, Rare to Die for Wallow to welcome us in with a song that he's prepared uh, especially just for you. So here we go. <laughs> yeah. Have you been song to before serenaded? At least in the past 12 months. <laughs> I don't think I have. <laughs> this will be pretty exciting. Get ready, mate. Get yeah. ready. Okay, okay, okay. So I will share some lyrics and I will share some music and we will begin. Okay. Uh, sound like such a show host. Anyway. Uh, okay. Who gives a crap if they're still pooping in the ground? Who gives a crap if you got nowhere to run? Who gives a crap if you got portable water? I'm on Griffith, gives a crap, Griffith. I'm on Griffith, gives a crap, Griffith. I'm on Griffith, gives a crap, Griffith. I'm on Griffith, gives a crap. There's a hole she to say it will pass with all it might Simon if it gives a crap if it Simon if it gives a crap Real, uh, real ghost, <laughs> real ghostbustery, real ghostbustery vibe. I felt there, Wallo. Yeah, super That's amazing. Yeah. Hey, thanks, thanks, Wallo. Good job, good job. Hey, um, Simon. So, um, I'd love to, yeah, jump right into the who gives a crap story. But before we do, tell us a little bit about yourself. So little bit of background you know where are you from what what was your upbringing like tell us a little bit, little bit about um simon griffiths yeah so we are as well actually an australian we moved to australia to to perth to the most isolated city in the world and that was where i grew up it's a pretty good place to be a kid you know hot summers um short winters short wet winters um but um yeah pretty great place to sort of have a childhood and you know in hindsight a very privileged place to have a childhood as well um and then uh, i think when i was um just after i turned 17 i i left home and took a year off and spent a year mm -hmm. um mostly in the uk a little bit in europe and a little bit in the us my brother was in the us at the time and then i came back and moved to victoria to study university um and so mm -hmm. i um studied um engineering and economics um which you know started actually in computer science and electrical engineering yeah. and then transferred over to commerce once i realized that um i kind of didn't want to do the later years of a computer science degree which gets pretty specialized and was just stuff that wasn't super interesting yeah, yeah, at the time. Yeah. um i wish i'd kind of stuck that out a bit a bit longer than i did i think i did a year and a half of a three-year degree mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. but great great background to you know have some of that exposure to comsci and then um you know really enjoyed economics in particular and development mm -hmm. economics um and so all of that stuff kind of sounds totally unrelated to running a toilet paper company but <laughs> in reality the skill set that i got um from my studies was around you know problem solving innovation markets um individual decision making behavioral kind of economics and development economics and so all of those things actually really tie 
pretty neatly into who gives a crap. It just doesn't mm -hmm. look like it would, um, you know, when you look at the degrees on paper. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think, um, you know, I was pretty, as a kid, pretty um, risk taking. So um, my favorite sport was downhill mountain biking and I was constantly injured in and out of hospital all the time. <laughs> um, you know, had some friends that went through pretty horrific accidents and um, kind of that probably slowed me down a little bit and realized that, right. you know, um, that I probably had other things I wanted to focus on mm -hmm. and um, was one of those kids that was very entrepreneurial. So sold mm -hmm. things to their friends at school, you know, um, was the, the kid that, you know, put letters in people's mailboxes asking if they needed someone to look after their pets when they're on holidays, like mm -hmm. did all of that stuff to- I'd do that um, now, actually. That's a great job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah now, now you wouldn't use a letter though. He'd use a, <laughs> use, use a website and serve someone an ad. Um, yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. you know, the, the, the good old days of direct marketing being, um, yeah, very, very direct marketing. Um, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, kind of, you know, I think um, ha had a pretty <clears> sort of, middle-class Australian upbringing. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, now understand the like actual great privilege of a middle-class Australian upbringing on a global scale. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, um, you know, I think because we'd moved from Australia to Australia from the UK, um, originally we'd just come for, for two years. And so we were supposed to go back when I was six. Mm -hmm. And when I turned six, we, we went back to the UK for two weeks because my mum had said to my dad, actually, let's do another two years. You know, I'm, I'm enjoying it more than I thought that I did. And mm -hmm. so every two years we'd extend our stay in Australia <laughs> by another two years. And that's my parents great. are still living there, you know, um, 30 something years later. Um, oh, and so, um, you know, I think because we were going backwards and forwards between Australia and the UK, um, did some pretty cool stuff as a, you know, a six, seven, 10, 11 year old, we went through, um, you know, parts of Egypt that weren't in civil war. There were parts that were in civil war at that time. Mm -hmm. um, we went to um, Zimbabwe and um, Japan and uh, kind of stopped on the trip back to the UK wherever it was convenient based on the, you know, the ticket that we were taking at uh -huh. that time. Uh -huh. awesome. um, and so I had some kind of really sort of formative um, travel experiences that I thought were pretty normal and didn't realize like how abnormal that was. Mm -hmm. Um, and that kind of led to this interest around, you know, why, why is my life different compared to someone else because of where I was born and, and where I grew up and why does that yeah. give me a different set of opportunities to someone else? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, how can you distribute those opportunities more fairly? Like what are the barriers that kind of hold, hold that back? Mm -hmm. And so that all led to a kind of fascination with development economics and, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, there's certainly, um, there aren't answers to those questions. And so I think, yeah. um, you know, throughout university, um, I spent a ton of time in data and then, you know, further afield in kind of South and Central America, um, actually just Central America, not South America, and then mm -hmm. also East and Southern Africa. Um, and <clears throat> kind of uh, didn't think too much of those experiences other than it being um, something that I enjoyed doing and I'd save up all three, spend all of my money in the holidays, you know, living in different parts of, of Southeast Asia and um, eventually other parts of the developing world as well. Mm -hmm. And to me, it was, um, you know, with an economist mindset, it was about maximizing utility. So um, mm -hmm. I knew I'd really enjoy those trips and, and took a lot out of them. Um, and the alternative was going back to stay with my family in Western Australia where um, it would cost the same amount of money, but I thought that I would enjoy myself a whole lot less. And mm -hmm. so, you know, for, for um, someone that was pretty young and naive, I really just saw it as um, me, you know, living, traveling, doing volunteer work, but, but actually just having the most enjoyable time that I could in my time away from studies. And mm -hmm. then towards the end of my degree, I actually started interrogating it a bit more and saying, why do I enjoy this? And, mm -hmm. you know, do I really want to go and work at um, an engineering firm or an investment bank or a management consulting firm and realize that, you know, my true passion was actually about development. And, and if mm -hmm. I could shift the needle on this kind of social mobility um, interest, then um, that was something that I was truly passionate about. And so if I could use the skills that I'd, I'd learned at university to focus on, um, you know, building businesses in the in Australia and eventually, you know, further afield, 
but mm-hmm. achieve outcomes in you know different parts of the developing world to help move the needle on social mobility. That was what I became really fascinated by. And so that's mm-hmm. a very long story that sort of <laughs> led to um, eventually the who gives a crap idea and you know walking yep. into a bathroom one day and saying, you know, why can't we sell toilet paper, use the profits to build toilets and caught who gives a crap? Mm-hmm. Caught a second business idea epiphany, you know, all, about 12 years ago now, I called three friends. This is kind of, um, you know, before um, the share button was on Facebook and before mm-hmm. people kind of posted stuff like that on social media. So I picked up the phone, called three friends and um, they all said, it's an awesome idea. I can't believe no one's done it before you should give it a crack. And the third friend uh, was Jehan, who mm-hmm. came and joined the business as, as one of the co-founders. And we set about trying to figure out how to bring the idea to reality. Yeah, that's an uh, incredible story. And I think um, it really fleshes out your mindset, I guess, a little bit to, to understand where you are and how you, how you got here. So thanks for sharing all that. I, um, I similarly have uh, traveled pretty extensively, 50 countries myself. And, and um, it's fascinating how uh, and not to not to be um not to be rude to australians and and people living in uh, the luckier parts of the world but it's it's crazy how little some people see of that side of the world and how how the reality of the way the world works is because how we live is the exception really like how how lucky we are with everything that we're um we're able to do so um yeah, that's super awesome. It's funny though because I feel like um, most people go into entrepreneurship and try and make money and then give back in some way. You know, oh cool, we're successful now. Let's make sure that with the money that we have, a portion of this, we we give back or we build something now later on down the line into our business model or whatever that may be. But you kind of went about it differently. So because um, from day one, when you set out with your um, with your 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 team it was with the business model that you currently have now which was 50 percent profits to 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 building to to, to charity really right yeah it was actually a little bit different so um when i you might have heard me when i said you know the the idea was um sell toilet paper use the profits Uh to build toilets caught who gives a crap so the original idea was actually to use a hundred percent of the profits to build toilets Uh um and you know so so for us it was all about the the impact side of things but when Mm -hmm. we took a step back and we were challenged by some, you know, really um, kind of smart minds to say, you know, is that truly the the way that you can create the most impact? Won't donating 100% of your profits actually restrict you because Mm -hmm. you, if you're a nonprofit, you can't raise equity, you can't use um, option plans to motivate, you know, to create comp Mm -hmm. packages for your team Mm -hmm. members. You know, there's Mm -hmm. a lot of restrictions that come with that, with that model. And, um, we thought about it and said, I think that's true. And if we're truly trying to maximize our impact, we don't want to constrain the growth of the company. So what mm-hmm. if we change it from from 100% to 50%? And you know, if we're trying to maximize our impact, we believe that this business can be at least twice as big and at least twice as successful if we're only donating half of the profits. And mm-hmm. therefore, the impact that we will be able to generate will be bigger than if we were donating 100% of our profits and, you know, less than half the size. Um, and so we made that change early on, but but purely with an impact lens. We we brought some investors into our business last year, and, and one of them said to us, "Most people would look at what you guys do as a business owner and say, damn it, I have to give away half of my profits.'" you guys look at it and say, yes, we get to keep half our profits. And that's actually like hit the nail on the head. Oh, it was kind of like, yeah. wow, that's, all about you know, really, yeah. Yeah, really kind of drums at home because yeah. that was never the goal. The goal was never yeah. to, you know, to create wealth for ourselves. The goal was always to move the needle on impact. And so mm-hmm. um, the way that we think about the world is quite different to the way that most people do, I guess. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's a, um, I think it's a fascinating new form of capitalism. I guess you would call it. Um, I was uh, personally trying to do some back of the napkin figures on impact that Athena could have um, and what we could bake into our model, like three years in, not not like you guys did, setting out from day one, but but um, into our model three years in, and and um, we ended up um, deciding on donating 5% of, uh, oh, sorry, investing 5% of our top line revenue into impact driven startups, which is really, really cool. That's the way we decided to go about it. Like kind of like wanted to do a similar line in the sand, like 
really like like serious amount like actually like something that would move the needle a little bit make some some impact but the funny thing is um i was trying to understand just like all the things you said okay cool if we were to follow the who gives a crap approach and give 50 percent of our profits to charity um you know what impact would that have on the business would we be able to raise capital what would it look like and i just um and i think i've mentioned this to you before um when we when we spoke last and when i did the back of the napkin figures i figured out that it was kind of incredible i took my um i took my scribble pad down the park with my um i had my dog my scribble pad and my dog's ball and i would throw the ball and i'll do a little bit of back of the napkin maths on like these different options that we could have in terms of baking in impact and then i thought all right who gives a crap this is such an amazing idea because i wonder how much more engaged their employees are i wonder how much more like they can charge onto their clients because they have a brand that actually does what it says and is for you know a good a good purpose. I wonder what their NPS score is. I wonder what power their brand holds with this. Like all these intangibles, I wrote down, and I'm telling you, it was back in the napkin, scribbling a few bits and pieces down. But I wrote down ten different metrics that are super important to a business. And I, you could talk to me or whatever. Like I assume that there's probably a one, two, three, four, five percent increase in all these different metrics, and. I'd love to hear your thoughts because it seemed to me very clearly that if those metrics moved in the direction that they should, you're probably making more money than you would have had you kept 100%. You know what I mean? (laughs) Yeah. And we don't think about it in in quite, you know, as... um kind of you know profit terms like that so yeah so that you know the the very original idea came from you know a microeconomic school of thought so mm-hmm. why does someone buy a product it's because that product has you know some benefit to them and so mm-hmm. the the idea was you know what if you could create a benefit that is above and beyond what a physical product can provide because mm-hmm. you're doing other things with the profits you know and if mm-hmm. you're trading mm-hmm. in a commodity market which mm-hmm. our product is then in theory you could you know incentivize consumers to buy your products by not changing the physical product at all and yeah. if that works in a commodity market then you can do it with so many other products that are out there mm-hmm. and so mm-hmm. toilet paper seemed like a really great place to start because um you know first of all it's related to this massive problem the sanitation mm-hmm. problem mm-hmm. and the sanitation problem is so off track because people don't like to- talking about it it's not you know yeah. it's not providing someone with access to clean water for the first time or restoring eyesight or some of these things that are a little bit more kind of sexy in terms of mm-hmm. development mm-hmm. this is mm-hmm. this is toilets and it's icky and it's gross and mm-hmm. as a result it's the most off track of all of the development goals that that we have in the world or it was when we started mm-hmm. i haven't looked at the numbers recently uh-huh. and um the you know the realization there was that we could actually use the product to talk about the sanitation problem which breaks the Mm -hmm. taboo of the sanitation problem Mm -hmm. and by doing that we market to our customers with a set of marketing that no other company you know no incumbent toilet paper company can go near because they've built their brands on bears and puppies and feathers and things that are actually Uh completely unrelated to the products and so it was this Uh kind of um, if it worked, it was kind of this silver silver bullet where we could incentivize customers to buy our products because of the sanitation problem, and we could mm-hmm. market in a way that no one else could because of the sanitation problem. And mm-hmm. you know, it works with toilet paper because of the sanitation problem. So it was this kind of yeah. beautiful, um, you know, um, yeah, kind of coming together of, of ideas. You know, mm-hmm. now we've been doing this for you know trading for about ten years, almost nine years. And um, you're exactly right. You know, with the with a stronger kind of understanding of how businesses work, when we look at our NPS, when we look at our, um, our engagement scores for our, our team members, you know, all of those things we shoot the lights out on compared to other companies because the level of buy-in and um, and you know the people love what we do. You know, we've made people fall in love with toilet paper, which is something that no yeah. one had ever done before. And that's because of everything that, you know, sits around the sides of the product rather than the actual physical product itself being, you know, the impact that we have and the packaging and fast delivery and real customer service and getting all of that right. And the impact's a huge part of that. Um, We're able to deliver something that's, that's really unique. And so that, yeah, that plays out. And as you said, 
um, you know, again, kind of engaging in investor conversations is really interesting, but I think what, what, what we took away from that was that we've been able to create something that is more valuable because we're giving away our profits. And yeah. that's really interesting when you think about the way that capitalism works because mm-hmm. it kind of breaks all of the physics of capitalism. You shouldn't be able to give away your profits and build a company that's more valuable as a result. Yeah. But that's, that's, that's what we're trying to prove out, that that's possible. And if it is possible, then every company in the world, in theory, should give away their profits to increase the mm-hmm. value of, of their business over time or make it more successful over time. And if we can show that that does work and does play out, then the impact that we can have on the world would be astronomical. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, my, all the favorite brands of mine that float around the internet and, and, you know, a lot of which everybody also would probably know and love, you know, you, you guys sit alongside, for me, the likes of Patagonia, you know, and and I feel like the best brands, you know, when you think about a consumer wanting to make a decision, they need to know, like, and trust you. But the best brands go that extra step. And you mentioned it yourself, like, it's know, like, trust, and love, you know? Like you have brand, you have brand love and um, it's, it's amazing. And I feel like it's, you know, because who gives a crap is a, is a great example of a phenomenally well-designed brand from the aesthetics perspective, colors, logos, fonts, you know, key visuals, blah, 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 all that stuff. But like the real meat is in the underpinnings of a brand, you know, the foundation of why it exists, you know, that's where the 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 most incredible part is how do you communicate like you mentioned um you mentioned this stuff is really like powerful for the team and and you know your uh, nps for the customers and so on and so forth but how do you communicate i'm just interested myself personally internally like the impact that you're having as a team and and what does that look like um on yeah your so end? i think like th- this is really important because it's not um you know getting getting um good engagement and you know um, a high MPS you know, and an impact being a moat essentially for us, you know, a, mm-hmm. a competitive advantage that gets stronger over time. Um, those, you know, those things, they don't, you can't just do that just by donating your money. You mm-hmm. you have to think about how to really um, build a brand around that and be transparent and authentic and um, make sure that you're, you know, held accountable for the promises that you're making to your customer and your team and you live by the values that that you put out in the world and so um it's not it's not as simple as just you know donating money it's Mm -hmm. it's actually making sure that um the goal to maximize those donations is the lens that you use to make decisions within the company and that your team and your customers understand that and that the ethics and values that you operate by are aligned to you know to to those um that guide that guide all of those decisions um mm-hmm. and so it's a it's um it's not something that i think is easy to do without having the authenticity and you know really being passionate about that this is a, a new and better way to go about building the business mm-hmm. um and so we have to think about how to bring our, our team along for that journey and our customers along for that journey and that we're not perfect and we're going to make mistakes along the way. And so how we work through those times that we don't get things right and, um, you know, continue to be guided by ethics and our values in those moments as well um, to ensure that, you know, people understand that we're not perfect, but we will constantly be trying to do things different and better. And this is a Mm -hmm. journey of, you know, continuously improving and getting better over time. Um, And so I think the challenge there is, you know, how much information is enough and how much information is too much and how do you give the right amount of information to people who just want, you know, a little bit versus people who want to go deeper and really kind of Uh dig into things. And so that's Mm -hmm. where tools like our blog become really useful where Mm -hmm. FAQs where, um, you know, someone can get in touch with us and we'll give them a response. You know, everyone that, that, um, that writes in will respond to, but we also want to enable people to go deeper into larger amounts of information if they want to. And so having those touch points that allow customers to get, you know, as shallow or as deep into issues um, that they're interested in is an important part of kind of bringing that all together and and getting that right. Um, Mm -hmm. And it's the same with our team. You know, we have a a policy of, I think we learned early on that um, we're going to get things wrong. And when we do get things wrong, it's actually important to stick our hand up and say, 
I'm sorry, 100%. I got that wrong. You know, mm-hmm. here's what mm-hmm. I'm going to go and do about it. And mm-hmm. so um, we have the same policy with our team. You know, we're very transparent about everything in our business. If someone asks us a question, we're never going to say that's confidential information. You're not allowed to know that information yeah. unless it's, mm-hmm. you know, privacy or um, probably privacy is the main one. Yeah. Um, you know, we'll always endeavor to answer those questions because we think that it's important to have that level of transparency with our team and, and often with our customers as well. Um, and so being committed to that and making sure that we're getting that right over time is a big part of um, of bringing our, our team and our customer along for the journey. Yeah, mm-hmm. so uh, Simon, do one thing I've discovered, I think, about uh, the world of business versus like consumers is like, people actually want to make the world a better place but sometimes it's not that easy because you know everyone is trying to still fend for themselves uh, different differences in economies differences in blah 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 but like businesses like yours stand to bridge the gap between like the effort that would have been required to do like the, to make the change in like the world and then the outcome so like businesses that are pro um social change impact whatever you know those things they are i believe that they are making the world a better place like th- these are the kind of people we bring to our podcast to discuss and share their stories but then there's the opposite side of it where like where you've been discussing around like um greenwashing in general where bigger like corporations pretend to care because they know that people people care about the world so they like i mean there was like a i can't remember this on instagram or something some fake company that claimed to be planting trees and stuff like that and it really put me off because it's like why why would you do that and there was so much support everyone loved this person and everything but then the question is now how do you think like other businesses who are genuinely trying to do good can like spot and deal with other businesses who are greenwashing like deal with in the most non-threatening uh <laughs> non <laughs> non-violent way yeah <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think like this is a this is a hard problem, and you know, in our business, we've now been successful, and so we have you know companies that have come along and copied our business model and um, try to tell very similar marketing messages, but don't follow through to the same degree. And so, I think um, you know the the good news is that that the internet's made everyone a whole lot smarter, and it's much easier to kind of research things and get to the bottom of things faster. And there's an expectation now of companies to respond to customer service inquiries, which, you know, when I was a kid, if you like wrote, wrote Smith's chips, a letter and you got a response, you were over the moon, but now it's like, why hasn't this company written back to my email? This is unacceptable. And so I think, um, you know, it kind of starts to put the power in the hands of the consumer more than what it ever was before. And Mm so, um, a little bit of research goes a hell of a long way from a consumer perspective. And we see it as our job to make it really easy for our consumers to find that information um, because they're looking for it or for us to communicate that information and do it in a fun and engaging way. That means that you know serious information about our impact and our donations and all of that stuff gets communicated in a way that someone will actually want to open that email and read it, even yeah. if they're not you know typically interested in that style of, of information yeah. being something that they consume every day. Um, and so I think, you know, the empowering the customer and then finding ways to, to give them that information that is compelling and enjoyable and doesn't feel like it's, um, you know, it's entertainment rather than, um, reading something that they feel is dry or boring. (laughs) Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Got a lot of, um, got a lot of memes and, uh, gifts you can call upon when you run a toilet paper company, Simon, I feel like <laughs> if you look at your Instagram, it's filled with, uh, plenty of lols and, and you're definitely doing that. That's yeah. all the storytelling super well. Um, Hey, is there any brands? This is just something on the, on the, on the brand thing. Um, considering, you know, what you've created with who gives a crap, who, who, who do you look at as inspirations in the world of business in general? I'm actually fascinated to, to know who, who are your you know, who do you look at and say, wow, they're amazing for X, Y, and Z reason? Yeah, I mean, I think there's like tons, tons of companies and everyone's for a different reason, right? So, mm-hmm. um, you know, you mentioned Patagonia before, they do an incredible job of, of living by their values. Um, mm-hmm. And so we admire that a lot and that their values drive, you know, very s- serious business decisions is super mm-hmm. inspiring and something that, mm-hmm. that um, 
you know, we try to live by as well. Um, but I think that, you know, we also look to, you know, Nike being some of the best brand marketers in the world. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. and the way they went about building their brand was very incremental, which is similar to us. You know, we we were bootstrapped for nine years. And so making Mm -hmm. lots of small bets constantly to kind of grow over time. And then we look to some of the, the newer age brand builders, like the Warby Parkers of the world, the all birds of the world that, um, have kind of done the opposite of that, where they've built a brand that is way bigger than the company and then allowed the size of the company to incrementally, you know, grow into the shoes of the brand. Um, Mm -hmm. so I think, yeah, different kind of horses for courses. Um, but, but as a, you know, almost a pure play direct consumer, um, people like Warby Parker and, and Dollar Shave Club and um, All Birds and Away have been really interesting to watch how they've gone about building their companies over time. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think, you know, from an impact perspective, Tom Shoes did an amazing job of kind of bringing out a donation model and, and showing the power of how that can work and resonate for a customer and shift incentives. Wobby Parker have an amazing donation model as well, which is often, you know, not talked about, but um, they're, I think, the largest funder of, of Vision Spring, which are a very powerful um, nonprofit that restores sight for people using glasses, low cost glasses. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So I think, yeah, lots of different organizations for different reasons. And we try to take, you know, how do we be the yeah. best at, the world at supply chain like mm-hmm. Amazon is, how do we be the best mm-hmm. at the world at brand like Nike is? How do we, mm-hmm. um, we're kind of constantly asking those questions and thinking about, mm-hmm. you know, who we put up on a pedestal for each of those things. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, that's great. Um, so you talked about, uh, the fact that you bootstrapped for, for nine years and, and so forth. So, um, I'm interested to dive into the, the growth story of, um, of, who gives a crap a little bit, but particularly from the lens of you as the leader. So, um, in the early days, you know, through the initial periods of gaining traction, now to turning into, okay, cool. Now I'm I'm raising level of funds. You know, international expansion. Like, how has your role as a leader changed from like day dot to where we are today? Yeah, it's changed. <laughs> it's changed so much. Um, we can so extend weird, the length uh, of the podcast by ninety <laughs> minutes if you need. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm actually it's a very big, expensive say, question. Yeah, I'm about to say how many employees or how many team members we are, but I actually don't know. So I'm just having a look. So yeah, we're 166 <laughs> people today, um, spread across I think seven countries, maybe oh, maybe mm-hmm. eight, um, mm-hmm. and. You know, we started in 2012 with a crowdfunding campaign. I think I was probably working, you know, 30 hours a week on who gives a crap at that point in time. The other founders had full-time jobs and were kind of moonlighting. Um, Mm -hmm. And so it's been a pretty crazy journey, you know, going from um, one person, which was just me initially, up to 160 odd around the world today. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. we're adding new people in every week at the moment because we're still growing quite quickly. Um, So, you know, I think... Um, the pace at which my role has changed has probably changed um, at the same pace as what we've increased our headcount. And I mm-hmm. think that's probably right for most CEOs because, um, you know, when you've got three people, you're on the tools. When you've got 10 people, mm-hmm. you're figuring out how you manage a team of 10 people. When you've got 100 people, you're figuring out how you lead several teams of, of mm-hmm. 10 people. And so the role's constantly evolving as you add more people into yep. the business. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I think, you know, early on, it probably changed every six to 12 months. Now it's changing every six months. And so mm-hmm. um, there's a couple of things I do to kind of help with that. One, which I haven't been able to do for the last couple of years is um, mm-hmm. I always take a three to four week holiday once a year. And for mm-hmm. me, and I deliberately do it right in the middle of the year, you know, not not over a period where everyone else is on holiday. So not, uh-huh. you know, August where the U S and Europe are, tend, tend to be on holiday and mm-hmm. not January where Australia tends to be on holiday. Mm-hmm. Um, and that means that I get to see what tasks fall through the cracks as I hand over my roles and responsibilities for mm-hmm. that three to four mm-hmm. week period. And mm-hmm. therefore, you know, delegate out who should be doing things now instead of me doing the things that I've been doing for the last 12 months. And so that's a really powerful tool for helping to 
um, continuously, you know, delegate and, and push responsibilities through the company to places where they should be instead of them falling onto my plate. And it's like a, a trial boot... period before you actually fully hand things off. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and as a bootstrap founder as well, you know, I found that um, like I, I, I'm still the person that gets all of our company mail, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and so that's probably not a job I should be doing at this point in time. <laughs> um, <laughs> But, um, you know, there's, there's reasons for that. Um, but it sort of makes you realize the, the tasks that probably shouldn't be on your plate, but have kind of slipped through the cracks over the years and that you're still kind of the glue that's holding those pieces together. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's a, you know, particularly as a bootstrap founder, it's a very powerful tool to kind of make sure that we're getting that roles and responsibilities and delegation right across the business. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, when people, when our team say, I want to take a longer holiday, I'm always supportive of it because I think it's really good for letting you see what's working well and what's not working well and giving the, the you the space, but also your team the responsibility to kind of make sure they're stepping into those things as well. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice. Um, so you and the team obviously bootstrapped um, for a number of years. Why the... Why the capital raise? What what changed in order, you know, nine years later? Obviously, you know, I haven't seen your books and what have you. Outside looking in, super successful, so on and so forth. And I think I remember somebody from Airtree saying somewhere, I think it was on LinkedIn, I don't know what it was in relation to, saying that um, Who Gives a Crap had the best metrics they've ever seen in any of their cohort companies Some, something along those lines so like you're obviously in a good position the brand's great um, super growth story but then you raised uh series a or said whatever you call it first round of fundraising what was it that made you do that yeah i think um there's a couple of things i think you know we we didn't want to raise money early on because when you raise capital you're signing up to exit the business essentially you know you have mm -hmm. to return on that capital in order to kind of fulfill your obligation to your shareholders and we didn't know when we started if our business could ever be exited you know could you sell mm -hmm. a business mm -hmm. could you ipo a business you know what does that look like we're not planning for an exit today but after nine years we felt that capital markets had shifted far enough that we believed that it would be possible to exit at some point in the future through mm -hmm. an IPO or a sale or whatever that looks mm -hmm. like. Now, mm -hmm. I'm just gonna take a step back. If we do that, it'll be guided by the impact of the business. So mm -hmm. the question we'll be asking is, how do we accelerate the path that we're on to make sure everyone in the world has access to a toilet and clean water? Mm -hmm. And a trade sale or an IPO would be a tool that allows us to get to that goal faster, either you know an IPO through being able to tap public capital markets or through a trade mm -hmm. sale, for example, um, mm -hmm. working with a new partner that has team that allows us to operationalize into all of these regions or countries that we can't get into very quickly or easily ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, so there are examples of when an exit might be relevant. Um, mm -hmm. And we just didn't know if that was possible. But after nine years, we thought, actually, you know, capital markets have shifted far enough that maybe this still isn't possible today, but we believe in another, you know, 10, 20, whatever years it is that, that it will be possible. And so we're willing to kind of take that bet and, um, you know, bring people into the business that will allow us to accelerate the path that we're on. And so we, I think, knew that, um, that, um, <clears throat> You know, our, our growth strategy is about finding more people to use our existing products and um, solving more problems for our existing customers. Um, mm -hmm. And we'd always done things sequentially, you know, one by one, we'd gone into a, a new market or um, done a new product. And now we're at a phase of growth where we have to start doing all of these things in parallel. And so mm -hmm. the capital mm -hmm. requirements to do these things in parallel gets more intense. We'd yeah. also been through the pandemic and we'd experienced, you know, short stocking which for us happened because mm. we we're running our inventory <laughs> levels relatively yeah. low which is a great way yeah. to you know in, maximize your cash flow it's not a great way to maximize your sales in a period where you've got um outsized demand um and so we wanted to have more balance sheet to allow us to you know go after some of those bigger opportunities and then mm. the last piece was that you know we are now in a world where i think it becomes every business's responsibility to think about how we can slow the impacts of climate change and in mm. our business which is a very supply chain heavy business the impacts of climate change um are very expensive kind of decisions that you have to make around 
you know, how do we um, start getting our product to our customers in electric vehicles? How do we, uh -huh. you know, use renewable power through every single part of our supply chain? These are things mm -hmm. that are not, you know, not small expenses to try and figure yeah. out or small problems yeah. to try and solve. And so having the, the balance sheet to go after them gives us the optionality to think about, you know, what those solutions could be with yeah. a mindset that was entirely different to how we'd approached it before. And so it was kind of a combination of all three of those things. Um, I think the, you know, the, the last piece was that we just sailed relatively close to the sun <laughs> and um, knew what it was like to, you know, to, <laughs> to feel your wax wings melting as you kind of got too close <laughs> to the sun. And, and yeah. we, th we thought that we were now at a scale where, you know, if we did that again and we got our cash flow modeling wrong, the size of um, the plug that you'd need to fix that problem was getting beyond the, the scope of the types of um, individuals that had helped us to solve those problems previously with loans or, you know, other um, financial instruments. And so we needed to think about our capital strategy differently in order to protect the future impact of the business by making sure that we had enough capital to see us through, you know, both the ups and the downs that will come in the future. Um, mm -hmm. So it was kind of a combination of all of those things at the same time. And, um, and then realizing that if we found the right investors, we could put people around the business who had seen a lot of the problems that we were about to see before and could help us find mm. solutions to those faster or connect us to people who could help to solve those solutions faster. And so the mm. mission or the criteria that we had for investors was first of all, deep mission alignment, which was a non-negotiable. Um, yeah. And you know, for some, some people might say, well, that's easy, you just find impact investors. The reality was that we found non-impact investors who had that deep mission alignment as well. And mm. that was super mm. interesting. Um, mm the the next criteria was patient capital because we didn't want to be on a five to seven year horizon to exit our business we wanted mm -hmm. to have 10 or 20 or 30 years to play out you know what is a big vision that we've got and the third criteria was um deep expertise and we started with consumer expertise because we wanted people who knew how to build consumer brands but then as we mm -hmm. started talking to people we realized there's actually an opportunity around um culture building expertise and mm -hmm. um you know, um, pure kind of founder expertise around mm -hmm. how you mm -hmm. grow and scale teams and how you solve some of those founder or founder CEO problems. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, that expertise kind of ballooned out of just being focused on CPG into actually how do we build and scale cultures and companies um, in powerful ways. Um, and so, yeah, we brought on a, a few different investors that kind of played to different strengths but all came with the the foundational benefits of you know deep mission alignment and mm -hmm. relatively patient capital. So I think our shortest horizon <laughs> is about ten plus two years on on their fund. Rel relatively patient. Relative <laughs> VCs will always only be relatively patient. <laughs> no, that's great. Yeah. That's great. I mean, I think I think the landscape for that is changing as well. You know, you look at mm -hmm. some funds. Um, um, like TCV is an example of this. They've just opened an office in Australia, but a big, you know, American fund, um, several billion dollars under under management, um, mm -hmm. and they, you know, have held Netflix shares from, you know, private through to public, and still still hold their positions in these companies. So, um, I think the VC landscape is changing because VCs are saying why would we sell our shares in some of these public companies when we believe that they've still got, you know, many decades of growth yeah. in front of them. Mm -hmm. And we've been so early on the journey that we have <clears throat> unique information that the market doesn't have that yeah. allows us to, you know, be better custodians of our capital than the typical shareholder. And so I think, I think the view on, um, on the typical five to seven year horizon is beginning to shift and we're going to start mm -hmm. seeing new mechanisms come into play for, for venture in the future, which is kind of cool. Yeah, epic. Hey, um, Simon, one final one for me before I throw it over to Walla, who will um, got a few, uh, always has a few rapid fire questions for us. What's the um, the five to 10 year, or maybe I'll go further than that because you're always kind of a man, I think that's talking in, in the, like you said, like in the further longer horizon. But what's the, let's say, big, hairy, audacious goal for who gives a crap? Um, what 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 would you when you finally you know hang up the toilet roll and you know sign off thanks i've given this a real real crack what what do you want to have achieved with with um the team 
Yeah. So I think, you know, hopefully everyone in our company would say the same thing and that's everyone in the world with access to, to a clean toilet and clean water by 2050. Um, so it's mm-hmm. a huge goal, 2 billion people still globally without access to adequate sanitation. Um, clean water is quite a bit better, but usually those two things go hand in hand. The research generally says that when you do, you know, one out of clean water, sanitation and um, education around the importance of hygiene and sanitation. If you do one of those three things, you're 10% as effective as when you do all three together, which is why Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. we look at both sanitation and clean water. Um, And so, um, you know, that's the goal. Are we going to, are we going to give 2 billion people access to sanitation? No, definitely not. But we think that we can make a pretty big dent in that problem. We also think Mm -hmm. that um, there'll be other funders that come in and do a great job. You know, the Gates Foundation are the largest mm-hmm. sanitation funder in the world. Um, mm-hmm. and there's, you know, hopefully going to be many more funders as well. And we also believe there will be hopefully technological innovation as well. So, you know, mm-hmm. a big problem is how you plumb or how you service unplumbable areas like urban slums, for example. Um, mm-hmm. And if we can start to mm. build solutions for, you know, above ground sanitation solutions that can go into homes in urban slum environments that solve that problem, then um, we'll start to be able to reach you know, many, many tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people globally as well. Um, and so 30 years is kind of the investment, the, the horizon that we're thinking about in terms of what mm-hmm. that opportunity, not opportunity, but what that that um, solution will take to, to implement and mm-hmm. we'll play a role in that. But we also hope to raise awareness, see other donors come in and, and have technological innovation to help bridge some of that yeah. gap as well. Awesome. So good. Um, over to you, Wallo. All right. All right. All right. <laughs> uh what is so quick um rapid fire you know what is your all-time favorite book um i i always go back to the lean startup because i think that was a book that um i think we were kind of you know 18 months into the who gives a crap idea and that book just accelerated our thinking so much that um yeah it like it's just a you know amazing book if i think it's now kind of part of startup culture so you kind of don't yeah. need to read the book but mm-hmm. that book really fundamentally changed um the way that we operated our business and so many other people did too so yeah that one yeah i was forced to read that book in school i didn't enjoy it so <laughs> i will have to go and look at this again because yeah because <laughs> it's not mm-hmm. as fun when you're forced to do it anyway yeah uh, yeah what is a favorite a tool that you can't live without uh for reference someone said breakfast I, <laughs> yeah. breakfast is a, a pretty good tool um yeah yeah maybe along that kind of train of thought for me nature like nature is a nature. fundamental kind of um tool for my mental health um so we don't live in a city we live out of a city for that reason yeah um we spend time in los angeles every year to work with our american team you know very closely but um i don't think i could live in a city full-time anymore because i need nature to be at my best so that's a tool that i couldn't live without yeah (laughs) love that yeah love that um my final question what do you have any advice for entrepreneurs trying to young entrepreneurs trying to um, do what you do you know um start businesses for the main purpose of impacting the world for better yeah i think there's probably two pieces of advice and the first is um it's much easier to join someone and learn from them than it is to to start something yourself and so mm. when we first got started we didn't have the luxury of that no one was building businesses that gave back and to us that didn't make any sense at all and so we looked around and said you know no one is doing this that we can go and join so let's go and start our own thing and see if we can turn this into into something that that makes sense because we believe that it should should exist but um you know i wished that we could have gone to someone else and shortcut the first five years by learning all the things that didn't didn't work and then Mm -hmm. being able to go and start our, our thing after that um, and so it's always easy to be, you know, in someone else's business and, and learn. And um, I think in might be the hard thing about hard things. I can't remember which book it is. Someone says, you know, the, the risk level of being the first person with an idea is so much higher than being the person that joins someone with a crazy yeah. idea. Yeah. And so being employee number 
one or two or three or you know joining as a co-founder is yeah. a pretty amazing way to kind of get in at the ground level mm-hmm. and kind of de-risk some of those things. And the yeah. other thing I'd say is if that's not an option and you are definitely going to start your own thing, then it's about yeah. just just getting out there and getting started. And, um, you know, big ideas can seem paralyzing. They can seem impossible to bring to life. And so saying, yeah. what do we want to achieve in the first year? What do we want to achieve therefore in the first month? therefore in the first week and therefore what am i going to do today to get us to that goal for the first week yeah. so breaking it down into the smallest possible chunk and just getting started is the most important thing because you know 90 percent of the time you're going to screw it up and get it wrong and so you have to just get started to figure out what's not going to work to get you one step closer to being successful mm. yeah thank you i got which one is, which is one... the lean startup <laughs> <laughs> i got one one final question simon what would you say would be the biggest change you had after raising capital in the company? Um, I think one of the, one of the things that we were actually really excited about, and this is what probably a lot of earlier founders don't get excited about was having a little bit more rigor in our business around, our um, kind of cycles of, um, of reporting and documenting decisions and a few other things. And so, um, having, um, the extra rigor and then the sounding board that could look at, you know, our thinking and say, you know, I think this is right, but maybe you could think about this differently, or we've seen this not work so well in other companies for these reasons, having that extra rigor and the sounding board that came with that was probably the most exciting thing. And it's just massively accelerated some of the, some of the things that we've worked on. Um, Mm -hmm. so amazing to kind of have people with that, um, expertise and what I call distilled thinking where someone can articulate something very quickly because they've seen it many times before in a way that, you know, when you're doing it for the first time, it takes you a long time to first try it out and screw it up and try it again. Um, and then distill what actually happened into, you know, a streamlined piece of thought. Um, so that's just been, you know, massively powerful for us as a business. Nice. Thanks. Quality. Um, Simon, look, that's it from us, mate. Thank you so much for um, coming on the show. Super inspirational story and one of the great Australian brands, really. So, um, yeah, really, really appreciate uh, you coming on and, and, and talking with us. Yeah, thank you so much. It's been great. Really enjoyed it. Cool. All right, from our end, that's a wrap. <laughs>